بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما Last week we spoke about the aftermath of the battle of Tabuk and the exposure of the munafiqeen the exposure of the hypocrites and these are some of the events that took place in the ninth year of the hijrah of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam also the ninth year of the hijrah of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is known as amul wufud the year of delegations the year of delegations because Many delegations from different tribes, from different parts of the Arabian Peninsula, they accepted Islam in the ninth year. And the number of Muslims increased greatly during that year. So the ninth year of the Hijrah was a great year for the acceptance of Islam by many different tribes all around the Arabian Peninsula. So many delegations arrived in Medina representing different tribes to announce their Islam, to declare that they believe in Allah and they believe in Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as the messenger of Allah. Now one of these delegations was the delegation from Yamama. The delegation from Yamama that came to Medina to accept Islam. Yamama is an area in the central region of the Arabian Peninsula. And the tribe that lived in Yamama is a huge tribe. The tribe of Yamama was a huge tribe that was known as Banu Hanifa. And it was such a big tribe, Banu Hanifa, that they had 100,000 people in this tribe. Huge tribe. So them accepting Islam, Alhamdulillah, it's a very big deal. So a delegation consisting of the leaders of the tribe of Bani Hanifa, they came to Medina to declare their acceptance of Islam on behalf of their tribe, on behalf of Bani Hanifa. So these leaders of Bani Hanifa, they formed this delegation and they came to Medina. Now, one of the members of this delegation was one of the leaders of Bani Hanifa and his name was Musaylimah. His name was Musaylimah. And he was part of this delegation that came to Medina. Now Musaylimah, he was not interested in accepting Islam. He didn't want to become a Muslim. But he joined the delegation anyways because he didn't want to be left out. He was one of the leaders of Banu Hanifa. And the other leaders of Banu Hanifa were part of this delegation. So he didn't want to be the odd one out, not being part of the delegation. Even though he personally had no interest in accepting Islam. So when the delegation reached Medina, they entered the city of Medina to meet the Prophet ﷺ and to declare their Islam. Except for Musaylimah, he didn't enter Medina. He stayed on the outskirts of Medina because he didn't want to become a Muslim. The rest of those leaders, they wanted to become Muslims. But Musaylimah did not, so he stayed outside, right outside on the outskirts of Medina. So the delegation, they came to Medina, they met the Prophet ﷺ, they accepted Islam. And after they accepted Islam, the Prophet Wasallam he distributed gifts to them. He distributed gifts to them. And then he asked them about their people. He asked these people in the delegation about the tribe and about Banu Hanifa. So they mentioned to the Prophet Wasallam. they said, Ya Rasulullah, there is one person who is from our leaders. He is one of the leaders along with us. He came with us, he joined this delegation with us, but he did not enter the city. And he is on the outskirts of the city and he is guarding our supplies. We came here with our supplies and he is the one who is supervising our supplies and guarding our supplies. And then the Prophet ﷺ said, Madama yahfadhu mata'akum laysa bisharrikum. If he is the one who you have entrusted to take care of your stuff, then he's not the worst one amongst you. That's a good thing that he's doing. He's taking the responsibility to guard the things. So this is a good quality. So the Prophet 
gave a share of gifts to be taken to Musaylimah as well. He said, take these gifts, you give them to the one who is taking care of your supplies. Go and give it to Musaylimah. So the delegation, they went back, they, they met Musaylimah, who was right there on the outskirts of the city. And they told him about their meeting with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And they told him that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said regarding Musaylimah, that he's the one, if he's the one who's taking care of your supplies, then he's not the worst one amongst you. And he gave these gifts for you. And they gave the gifts to Musaylimah. So Musaylimah was happy to receive these gifts. And he was happy to hear these words of praise from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that he praised him for staying and taking care of the goods. So he became happy with this and he said, Madahani Muhammad, Muhammad has praised me. So he decided to go inside the city, go to Medina, go to the masjid of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and check out the situation of Islam for himself. So he went into Medina, he went into the masjid of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he sat down in the masjid with some other members of the tribe, of his tribe of Banu Hanifa. They had accepted Islam. The other members of the delegation, they had accepted Islam. Musaylimah was the only one who did not accept Islam. So Musaylimah and other members of the delegation, they're sitting in the masjid now. And those other members of the delegation are trying to convince Musaylimah to accept Islam. You should become a Muslim too. And as we know, the home of the Prophet wasallam, the house of the Prophet wasallam, was connected to the masjid. And it was separated from the masjid just by a curtain. So the Prophet ﷺ's home was here. Then there's a curtain and the masjid is on the other side of the curtain. So as Musaylima and the other members of Banu Hanifa were sitting in the masjid and they were trying to convince Musaylima to accept Islam, Musaylima kept refusing. He's saying, I don't want to be a Muslim. Then finally he says, okay, if Muhammad makes me the leader of the Muslims after he passes away, then I will become a Muslim. If he promises to make me the leader after he passes away, then I will become a Muslim. As he was making this statement, the Prophet ﷺ was coming out of his house into the masjid. So the Prophet ﷺ heard Musaylima say this, that if Muhammad makes me his successor, then and only then I will become a Muslim. So the Prophet ﷺ was not happy with this. This shows that this person, he doesn't want to become a Muslim for Allah. He's only looking for personal power and status. So the Prophet ﷺ was not happy with this. And the Prophet ﷺ picked up a small twig, a small twig. And he said to Musaylima, even if you were to ask me to give you this twig, even if you were to ask me for this twig, I would not give it to you. Forget about the position of leadership. I'm not going to give that to you. I wouldn't even give you this small twig. And then the Prophet ﷺ continued and he continued addressing Musaylima and he said, and I believe that you are one of the liars that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showed me in my dream. And if you do not accept Islam, then Allah will slaughter you. Allah will destroy you. So Musaylima, he was angry at this. And he did not accept Islam. And he left Medina and he went back to Yamama. He went back to his tribe in Yamama. So the Prophet ﷺ mentioned this dream. And the Sahaba, they heard the Prophet ﷺ speaking to Musaylima. So then they asked him, they asked the Prophet ﷺ, Ya Rasulullah, what is the dream that you saw that you were talking to him about? that he is one of the liars that you saw in your dream. What is this dream? So the Prophet ﷺ, he narrated his dream to the Sahaba. He said, I saw in my dream the treasures of this earth. They were gathered for me. And in the palms of my hand, there were two gold bracelets. In the palms of my hand, there were two gold bracelets. And I didn't like this. I didn't like these gold bracelets. So I blew on them. I blew on them and then they flew away. The gold bracelets, they flew away. And the Prophet ﷺ continued and he said, I interpreted this to mean that there will be two liars. 
So these two golden bracelets, they represent two liars. So the Prophet ﷺ said, I interpreted this to mean that there will be two liars who come in my lifetime. And what the Prophet ﷺ meant by two liars, two people who will falsely claim to be prophets during the lifetime of the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ. And those two liars turned out to be Musaylimah, he was one of them. Musaylimah al kazab as he was later named by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Musaylimah the liar. And the other one was Al-Aswad Al-Unsi. Musaylimah was from Yamama and Al-Aswad he was from Yemen. And both of them, they were destroyed by Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Both of them were killed. Alright, so after Musaylimah left Medina and he went back to Yamama, he sent a letter to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He sent a letter to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this letter was delivered to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Medina. And the letter read, Min Musaylimah Rasulillah ila Muhammad Rasulillah. Anta Nabi wa ana Nabi. Wa ana utitu al-amra ma'ak. Falaka nisfu al-ardi wa liya nisfuha. Walakinna Qurayshan qawmun la ya'dilun. So this letter from Musaylimah, it said from Musaylimah, the messenger of Allah, to Muhammad, the messenger of Allah. You are a prophet and I am a prophet. And I have been given this affair along with you. I have been given prophethood just like you have been given prophethood. So you have half of the earth and I have the other half of the earth. But the Quraysh are a people who are not fair. The Quraysh are a people who are unjust. This was the letter that Musaylima wrote to the Prophet ﷺ. So the Prophet ﷺ responded to the letter of Musaylima. Musaylima, who is now claiming that he is a messenger of Allah. So the Prophet ﷺ responds to his letter by saying, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Min Muhammad Rasulillah, Ilah Musaylima Al Kazab. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim from Muhammad the Messenger of Allah to Musaylima the liar. Assalamu ala man ittaba al huda. Peace be upon those who follow the guidance. Fa inna al arda lillah yurithuha man yasha'u min ibadi wal aqibatu lil muttaqin. Surely the earth it is for Allah. The earth belongs to Allah and he gives it to whomever he wills from his servants. And a good end is for the muttaqeen, for the people who fear Allah and have taqwa of Allah. But Musaylima, he did not pay any attention to this letter from the Prophet ﷺ and he continued upon his falsehood. He continued with his false claim that he was a messenger of Allah. And he continued to tell people that he was a prophet of Allah. Now, one of the members of Banu Hanifa stayed behind in Medina. One of the members of the tribe of Banu Hanifa who had accepted Islam, instead of going back to Yamama, this man, he stayed in Medina in order to learn the religion, in order to learn the Quran, to learn the rulings of Islam, so he could go back to his people. He could eventually go back to Yamama and he could teach the tribe of Bani Hanifa Islam. So one member of the tribe stayed back in Medina. And he was a man named Nahar ibn Unfuwa, also known as Nahar al Rahal. Nahar al Rahal. So he was one of the members of the delegation who had accepted Islam and he was staying in Medina to learn Islam so that he could go back to his tribe and teach the people the religion. So he stayed in Medina, he learned many of the rulings of Islam, he memorized some surahs of the Quran with Ubay ibn Ka'b. Ubay ibn Ka'b was the greatest reciter of the Quran from amongst the Sahaba. So Nahar al Rahal, he learned some surahs with Ubay ibn Ka'b. And the, the reason behind this was to gain knowledge and go back and teach it to his people, teach it to the tribe of Banu Hanifa. So he stayed in Medina for some time. Now Abu Huraira, radiallahu anhu, he narrates an incident that scared him a lot. Abu Huraira was very afraid. 
with this event that occurred. So Abu Huraira narrates that once he was sitting with Nahar al-Rahal, this man from Banu Hanifa, Abu Huraira was sitting with Nahar and there was a third person also in that gathering from the Ansar. So three people sitting in a gathering. Abu Huraira, Nahar al-Rahal, and a third person from the Ansar. So these three people are sitting and the Prophet wasallam passes by them. And as the Prophet wasallam passes by them, he says, إِنَّ فِيكُمْ لَرَجُلًا ضَرْسُهُ فِي النَّارِ أَعْظَمُ مِنْ أُحُدْ that from amongst you three people, there is one of you whose molar tooth in the fire of Jahannam is bigger than the mountain of Uhud. So what is the Prophet ﷺ saying here? That from amongst you three people sitting here, one of you is in Jahannam. And who was it? It was Abu Huraira, it was Nahar al-Rahal, and it was a third man from the Ansar. So Abu Huraira said he got very scared. He was thinking it's a one in three chance that I am in Jahannam. So Abu Huraira was very scared when the Prophet ﷺ said that. And then, after some time, that man from the Ansar, the third person who was with them, the Ansari man, he died. And he died as a Muslim, as a good Muslim. So now Abu Huraira is even more scared. Now it's just me and Nahar al-Rahal who are left. So he was very afraid that he might be the one that the Prophet ﷺ was talking about in the fire of Jahannam. So Abu Huraira is very scared. And what makes him even more scared? There are only two of them left now. And he sees Nahar reading Quran, memorizing Quran, learning Islam, praying Salah. So he's so scared that the Ansari one, he already died as a good Muslim. And Nahar, look how pious he is, memorizing Quran, praying, doing ibadah. So now Abu Huraira is very scared that it might be me. It might be me who is the one of those three who is in Jahannam. So eventually the Prophet ﷺ sent Nahar back to Yamama, back to his tribe to teach Bani Hanifa Islam. He had learned enough there in Medina now, ready to go back to Yamama to teach the people there Islam. So he went back to Yamama. Nahar al-Rahal, he returned back to Yamama. But before he met with the people to start teaching them the religion of Islam, before he met with them, Musaylima al kazab got to him first. Musaylima met him first and he asked him what happened. What is the news from Medina? So Nahar, he told him that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has sent me back to my tribe to teach the people Islam. Now, Nahar al-Rahal, he is from the tribe of Banu Hanifa, but he is a layman. He is not a person of high status. He is not a person who has a big position in the tribe. He's just a normal guy in the tribe. Musaylima, on the other hand, is one of the VIPs of Bani Hanifa. He is a person of very high status in the tribe. He is a leader of the tribe. So Musaylima, he said to Nahar, he said, look, just tell the people that Muhammad confirms that Musaylima is also a messenger of Allah. Just tell the people that Muhammad is saying that Musaylima is also a prophet. And if you do this, if you do this for me, then I will make you a wazir. I will make you a minister in this tribe. I will give you a very high position in this tribe. All you need to do is tell the people that Muhammad confirms that Musaylima is also a messenger of Allah. Now Nahar, he's a layman, a common guy, an average Joe. And now he sees the opportunity to become a person who is powerful, a person who has a high status in the society. So his greed for power overcame him and he agreed to this request of Musaylima. So he actually announced to the tribe of Bani Hanifa, I have come from Medina, I have come from Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and he has told me to tell you that Musaylima is also a messenger of Allah. He lied upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So now it is clear that it is Nahar al-Rahal who is the one of those three who is in the fire of Jahannam. He apostated from Islam and he started to tell the people that Musaylima is a messenger of Allah. 
So this is the danger of the love for power. Sometimes it can lead a person to riddah. It can lead a person to apostasy. billah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to keep us safe. So now the people of Banu Hanifa, the tribe of Bani Hanifa, they're confused. They're confused. And a number of them start to accept Musaylimah as a messenger of Allah. They start to follow Musaylimah. And he starts to accumulate followers. He starts to accumulate a rather large following. Many people start to follow him and accept him as a messenger of Allah. billah. But the reality is that Musaylimah, he was an idiot. He was a very stupid person. And he claimed to receive revelation like the Quran. He claimed that he was receiving revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just as the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam receives revelation from Allah. And from the false made up revelation that he started preaching to the people, he tried to make up surahs and he thought that he could make it similar to the Quran. So one of his surahs was Surah Al-Fil. A surah that he made up that he called Surah Al-Fil. And the surah goes like this. Al-Fil, Mal-Fil, wa ma adraka Mal-Fil, lahu dhanabun radheel, wa khurtumun tawil. Even if you don't know Arabic, you'll just laugh at the sound of this. It doesn't sound anything like the Quran. Al-Fil, Mal-Fil, wa ma adraka Mal-Fil. The elephant, what is the elephant? And what will explain to you what the elephant is? It has a scraggly tail and it has a long trunk. This was one of the surahs of Musaylimah's Quran. It's a joke. So this is what he tried to do. Also, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was given many miracles by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Miracles that showed that he was a truthful messenger of Allah. So Musaylimah wanted to have miracles too. Like the Prophet sallallahu had miracles. One of the examples of one of the miracles of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was on the day of Hudaybiyyah. There were about 1,400 companions with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam at Hudaybiyyah. 1,400. And they were very low on water and they became thirsty. So the Prophet ﷺ ordered the companions to take an arrow from the quiver of the Prophet ﷺ and to put that arrow in the well of Hudaybiyyah. And when they did that, the water started gushing forth. This was from the barakah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave to the Prophet ﷺ. This was a miracle of the Prophet ﷺ. The water started gushing forth so that all of those companions, all 1,400 of them could drink to their fill. They could quench their thirst and also make wudu with that water. The water problem was gone. So Jabir radiallahu anhu, he narrates this incident that it was enough water for everyone. So they asked Jabir, how many people were there with you on that day? And Jabir said, even if we were 100,000 people, it would have been enough. We were 1,400, but even if we were 100,000, it would have been enough because this was a miracle that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The barakah and giving an abundance of water. So Musaylimah thought that he could do something like this too. So there was a well that had dried up, uh, that had very little water in it. So Musaylimah, he wanted the water to gush forth. It had a little water in it. And Musaylimah wanted it to gush forth. So he spit in that well, hoping that the people would think that he has barakah in his saliva and the water would gush forth. So he spit in that well that had some water in it and it completely dried up after he spit in it. It completely dried up. Then there was another well. He spit in that well and the water, it became bitter and salty that nobody could drink it after he spit in it. So he's trying to show miracles but instead Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is humiliating him. One of the believers in Musaylimah, one of the people who believed that he was a messenger of Allah, brought his son to Musaylimah to pray for him and to make dua for him for barakah. So he brought his son to Musaylimah. Musaylimah put his, his hand on this boy's head to give him blessing. He put his, his hand on the boy's head. And what happened to the boy? He became bald. He lost all of his hair because Musaylimah touched his head. Allah is humiliating Musaylimah like this. Another example, if you remember when we spoke about the battle of Khaybar, when the Prophet ﷺ wanted to give the flag to Ali ibn Abi Talib. 
And Ali on that day, radiallahu an, he had a problem with his eye. His eye was infected. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he spit in the eye of Ali radiallahu an, and suddenly his eye was cured. He had no problem with it. His eye was infected, the Prophet ﷺ, with his blessed saliva, he spit into the eye of Ali radiallahu an, and he was perfectly fine immediately. And he took that flag and they conquered that fortress on that day. Alhamdulillah. So this is another miracle of the Prophet ﷺ, the healing in his saliva that cured the eye of Ali radiallahu an by the permission of Allah. So Musaylima, he wanted to do something like this too. A man came to him, one of his followers came to him. And this man had an injury in his eye. He lost sight in one eye. He could see with one eye, but the other eye he couldn't see with that eye. So he came to Musaylima to get shifa, to get ilaj, to get treatment for this. So Musaylima thought, okay, maybe I can show a miracle here. He spit in that eye of that man. And instead of that eye being cured, the other eye became blind too. So now this guy is completely blind. So this is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continuously humiliated Musaylima al-Kazzab, Musaylima the liar. And all of these things were proof that he is a liar. Just like all of the miracles of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa were proof that he is truthful and a true messenger of Allah, this humiliation of Musaylima is proof that he is a liar and he is someone who is humiliated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Anyhow, the fitna of Musaylima continued even after the death of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the fitna of Musaylima continued. So Abu Bakr Radiallahu An, when he took over the Khilafah, he sent an army against Musaylima to finish this fitna once and for all. He sent an army under the command of Khalid ibn al-Walid at the Ma'raka al-Yamama, the battle of Yamama, to fight Musaylima and his followers. So Musaylima was killed, alhamdulillah, by Wahshi. Wahshi Radiallahu An, he is the same person who previously, many years before that, had killed Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib, the uncle of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, at the Battle of Uhud. But then after that, Wahshi became a Muslim. But he always carried that guilt that I killed the uncle of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. I killed Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib. So he always carried that burden, that guilt, with him. But when he killed Musaylima al kazzab he felt a little comfort after that. He said, Inshallah, I hope the fact that I killed this evil man, Musaylima al kazzab this false prophet, I killed him. I hope, Inshallah, that that will cancel out the evil that I did when I killed Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib radiallahu an. So this was Musaylima al kazzab and the fitna of Musaylima al kazzab also from the incidents that occurred around this time period during the ninth year of the hijrah was the acceptance of islam of adi ibn hatim at tai and he was the leader of the tribe of at tai the tribe of at tai it is in the northern part of the arabian peninsula now the father of adi ibn hatim at tai his father was hatim at tai and Hatim al tai was legendary, very famous amongst the Arabs as one of the most generous men who ever lived. And the way he honored his guests, it was legendary. So Hatim al tai he had a great reputation as a generous man and as a man who honored his guests. His son was Adi ibn Hatim. And they were from the region of at tai which as we mentioned, it's in the northern part of the Arabian Peninsula. And the people of at tai they were Christians. They were Christians. Now Adi, after his father passed away, after Hatim at tai passed away, Adi, he became the leader of the tribe of at tai He became the leader of the tribe. And he was aware that now Islam, it's spreading all over the place. It's spreading all over the Arabian Peninsula. So he was afraid that eventually the Muslims are going to come up to at tai as well and they are going to be conquered as well. He was afraid that this is eventually going to happen. So there was a monastery, a Christian monastery where the monks lived that was between Medina and at tai Between the city of Medina and between the city of at tai in the middle of the path, there was a Christian monastery where some monks used to live and worship. So 
Adi ibn Hatim al Ta'i, he said to the caretaker of that monastery, he said, Look, if you see the Muslims coming towards this direction, then send me a message. Because to come from Medina to at Tay, they would have to pass by that monastery. So Adi, he said to the caretaker of that monastery, he said to the monk, If you see the Muslims coming towards at Tay, coming in our direction, then just give me a warning. Send me a message so that we can prepare ourselves for them. So eventually what happened, the Muslims, they came in that direction. They were going towards at Tay, And this monk, he sent a message to Adi ibn Hatim al Tay that yes, the Muslims, they're coming. They're heading in your direction. So what was Adi's response to this? Did he warn his people? Did he tell them prepare for war or anything like that? No, he didn't do any of that. Rather, he took his wife and his children and his wealth and he fled. He, he left Al-Tay and he went to Asham. He went to Syria area. And he didn't tell anybody about what's happening. He just took his immediate family, his wife and his kids. He took his wealth and he left himself. And then eventually the Muslims came and the people of Al-Tay, they didn't expect this and Adi did not warn them so the Muslims came and they they conquered Atay and they took some prisoners that they caught back to Medina from the captives that the Muslims caught in Atay was the sister of Adi ibn Hatim the daughter of Hatim at tai and her name was Safana bint Hatim at tai so she was one of the cap captives so the Muslims, they brought the captives back to Medina and the captives were placed in an area nearby the masjid so that when the time for salah came, the captives could see the salah, they could witness the salah and hopefully, you know, they would be impressed by it and they would enter Islam. So whenever captives would come to Medina, they would always be near the masjid so they could witness the salah. So these captives from At-Tay, which included the sister of Adi ibn Hatim, her name was Safana bint Hatim. She was one of the captives and she was kept there near the masjid. So when the Prophet ﷺ came out to lead the salah, when he came out to the masjid to pray, Safana, she saw him and she stood up and she said, I am Safana, I am the daughter of Hatim at tai My father has died and my caretaker, the one who was supposed to take care of me, he left me. She's talking about her brother here. Her brother was taking care of her after her father died. But now her brother, he left. He went to Sham. And she was left without her caretaker. So she said to the Prophet ﷺ, I am Safana. I am the daughter of Hatim. My father has died. My caretaker has left me. So please have mercy upon me and honor me. So then the Prophet ﷺ asked her, Who is your caretaker? Who is your caretaker? And then she said, My brother Adi. He was my caretaker, but he left and he went to Asham. So the Prophet ﷺ, he didn't say anything to her. And he said to her, he said to her, is he trying to run away from Allah and his messenger? She mentioned that he ran away. And then the Prophet ﷺ said, is he trying to run away from Allah and his messenger? Where is he running to? He's trying to run away from Allah and his messenger. And that was it. The second day when the Prophet ﷺ came out for salah, Safana, she did the same thing. She stood up and she said, I am Safana, the daughter of Hatim al tai My father has died. My caretaker has left me. Please have mercy upon me and honor me. And the Prophet ﷺ replied in the same way. Is he trying to run away? Is your brother trying to run away from Allah and his messenger? And that was it. And she was still kept captive. Now the third day when the Prophet ﷺ came out for Salah, Safana didn't try to say anything this time. She had lost hope. I tried the first day, I tried the second day. He didn't let me go. So she lost hope. She didn't say anything the third day. But Ali ibn Abi Talib, he was behind the Prophet ﷺ. And he gave a signal to Safana. He gave a signal to Safana. Just stand up and ask one more time. Stand up, ask one more time. Because Ali radiallahu anh, he knew the nature of the Prophet ﷺ. He knew the character of the Prophet ﷺ. That if you ask him, and you ask him again, and you ask him for a third time to honor you and to have mercy upon you, he will accept it. So Ali radiallahu anh knew that if she just gets up and asks one more time, the Prophet ﷺ will honor her and he will free her. 
So she didn't know this herself. So the third day she didn't say anything. She was silent. So Ali radiallahu anh just gave her a signal. Just stand up, stand up and just say it again. So she understood the signal. So she, she stood up and she said it again. She said, I am Safana. I am the daughter of Hatim, a Ta'i. My father has died. My caretaker has left me. Please have mercy upon me and honor me. And then the Prophet ﷺ replied the same way. He said, is your brother, your caretaker, he's trying to run away from Allah and his messenger. As for you, you are free. As for you, you are free. So he freed her. And then he said to her, and if your brother comes here, if your brother comes to Medina, we will honor him. We will show him respect and we will honor him. So she was very happy with this response of the Prophet ﷺ. She's free now and he also promised to honor her brother as well. So she requested the Prophet ﷺ. She said, if there's any caravan that's going to Syria, if there's any caravan that's going to Syria, please let me join that caravan so that I can get my brother and I'll bring him back to Medina. So when a caravan was going to Syria, the Prophet ﷺ allowed her to accompany that caravan and go to Syria to get her brother. So when Safana arrived in Syria, she met her brother there. She met Adi over there and she was very angry with him. And you can imagine, of course she was angry with him. He left without any notice, without any warning. So she was very angry with him and she started speaking to him with very harsh words. And he didn't try to defend himself. He said, yes, what I did was wrong. It was not the right thing that I did. I'm very sorry. He admitted his mistake and that calmed her down. Usually if you're getting mad at someone for doing something wrong and that person is not defensive, that person admits that he was completely wrong, this is something that calms you down. That, okay, he's admitting his mistake. I don't need to get so mad. So she calmed down. And then she said to her brother, she said to her brother, I have come to you from the most honorable person that I've ever met in my life. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He's the most honorable person that I've ever met. And... He is one of two things. He is either a king or he is a prophet. He's either a king or he is a prophet. And then she said to him, look, if he is a prophet, if he is a prophet, then being his companion is the opportunity of a lifetime. How many people actually get the chance to be a companion of a prophet? If he is a prophet, then to be his companion, this is an opportunity of a lifetime. And it's the greatest honor that you can ever get. And if he is a king, then I can tell you that he is the best king. He is merciful. He is generous. He has the best character. So either way, you have nothing to lose. Just come to Medina. Meet him. Whether he is a prophet or whether he is a king, you don't have to worry. You will be respected and you will be honored with him. So he agreed to this. He said, okay, if, if you're saying like this, I trust you. I will go back with you to Medina. So the sister and the brother, they both came back to Medina. When Adi entered Medina, the Prophet ﷺ received him with honor and he made him his personal guest to stay in his own home. Imagine this, the Messenger of Allah ﷺ is inviting you to be his personal guest and you stay in his home. This is the honor that he gave to Adi ibn Hatim. Even though Adi had not accepted Islam yet. He was not a Muslim yet. On the way, as they were going to the home of the Prophet ﷺ, so the Prophet ﷺ with Adi, they're going towards the home of the Prophet ﷺ. And an old woman came, an old weak woman. She came to the Prophet ﷺ and she said, Ya Rasulullah, I need to talk to you about something. There is some issue I need to discuss with you. So the Prophet ﷺ said, okay. And he gave that woman his attention. He gave that woman his time. And Adi is just witnessing this. And he's thinking to himself, this is not the character of a king. A king is not going to talk to common people like this. An old woman in the street and he's giving her so much importance and so much attention. This is not the characteristic of a king. Rather, this is the characteristic of a prophet. So this clicked in his mind. Eventually, they reached the house of the Prophet ﷺ and they entered the house. And when Adi entered the house of the Messenger of Allah ﷺ, what did he find in the house? Nothing. Nothing. Just an old mat, an old rough mat, and a cushion, a simple cushion to sit on. That's it. That's the contents of the house of the Prophet ﷺ. So when Adi, he saw this house, he said, this is not the house of a king. 
There's no king who would have a house that is so simple like this with just a rough mat and a simple sitting cushion like this. So when they entered the house, the Prophet ﷺ gave the cushion, the sitting cushion to Adi. He said, you sit on the cushion. And the Prophet ﷺ himself, he sat on the floor. And then Adi, he said, no, 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 no. I will not sit on the cushion. You sit on the cushion. But the Prophet ﷺ insisted, no, 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 you sit on the cushion. Don't, don't worry. You sit on the cushion and I will sit on the floor. And the Prophet ﷺ sat on the floor. The humbleness of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Adi is sitting on this simple cushion. So this really touches the heart of Adi. And he says, this is, this is not the lifestyle of a king. Rather, this is the lifestyle of a messenger, of a prophet of Allah. Then they started talking. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Adi started talking with each other. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked Adi. He said, Ya Adi, aren't you a follower of the religion of Ar-Rakusiyah? You are a follower of the religion of Ar-Rakusiyah. Ar-Rakusiyah was a religion that had elements of Judaism and elements of Christianity. It was not Judaism and it was not Christianity, but it had elements of both Judaism and Christianity in it. And it was a religion that had gone extinct. There was no one who followed that religion. At that time, Adi ibn Hatim, he was the only one who was following that religion didn't have any followers. It was an old religion that had gone extinct. And Adi ibn Hatim felt that this was a more correct religion than either Judaism or Christianity. But he didn't tell that to anyone. He followed it personally, but he did not even tell his own wife and children that he is following this religion. And the tribe of at they were Christians. The tribe was Christian, but Adi himself was following ar rakusiyah and this was between him and Allah. He never told anyone about it. So when the Prophet ﷺ said to him, Ya Adi, aren't you following the religion of Ar-Rakusiyah? Adi was shocked. How can he know this? How can he know this? And he said, Yes, I am following the religion of Ar-Rakusiyah. And then the Prophet ﷺ asked him, Don't you take the mirba' from your people? Mirba, it's a type of tax. It's a type of tax. So Adi, he was the, the leader of his tribe. So there was a tax that he was collecting from them. And that was called the Mirba. So the Prophet ﷺ asked him, don't you take the Mirba from the people? And again, Adi is surprised. How does he know this? How does he know this? But he admitted, he said, yes, I take Mirba from the people. And then the Prophet ﷺ said to him, don't you know that taking the Mirba is haram in ar rakusiyah Don't you know that in the religion of ar rakusiyah taking this tax is haram? Now he's even more surprised. How does he know what is ar rakusiyah How does he know that I follow ar rakusiyah How does he know that I take the mirba? And how does he know that the mirba is haram in ar rakusiyah All of these things. How can he know any of this? So this was enough proof for him that the Prophet ﷺ knows all of this stuff that he thought nobody else knew, not even his family knew it about him. This was enough for him to understand that this man is the messenger of Allah. So he took his shahada. He said, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu annaka Rasulullah. I bear witness that there is no one worthy of worship except Allah. And I bear witness that you are the messenger of Allah. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So this was the Islam of this great leader of the tribe of at tayt the son of Hatim al-Ta'i, Adi ibn Hatim al-Ta'i. So next week, inshallah, we will continue to speak about the different delegations. And we will start with the delegation of Christians that came from Najran to Medina to meet with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So we'll speak about that next week, bi-ithnillah. Wallahu alam sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa baraka ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in.